Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. We all experience physical pain. It's, it's an uncomfortable or unpleasant sensation in the body. It's a defense mechanism for your body to tell you that something is wrong, that you've stepped on something sharp or the water is, in your bath is too hot. The term acute is used in medicine to describe the time scale of a disease or condition. Acute pain is that which may come on quickly as with a broken bone, but ends as a condition improves. Other sources of acute pain are dental work, cuts, burns, surgery, labor, childbirth. The related term chronic indicates indefinite duration and intensity with little or no improvement over time. Chronic pain may manifest as low back pain headaches, arthritis, or pain from an underlying disease such as cancer. Tonight we investigate the range of treatments used to alleviate pain, including the over-the-counter or OTC pain relievers found in our medicine cabinets at home, or the powerful and potentially addictive drugs prescribed by physicians. They all need to be taken with care. We'll also look at some valuable alternatives to drugs in the fight against pain. The proper use of pain medications and treatments, the side effects of OTC pain relievers, and the potential for developing addiction to the anti-pain prescription drugs are, if improperly used, is widely misunderstood. To help us gain a better understanding, I'm joined by Dr. Chris Diedrich of the Rehab Doctors in Rapid City, and Dr. Craig Uthie of Sanford 49th and Oxbow Family Medicine in Sioux Falls. Chris, tell us a little bit about what you do. What is your, your uh, specialty? So I'm a physiatrist or a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. Uh, we work at the rehab doctors in Rapid City. We do a lot of different things. We provide uh, both acute and chronic pain management of all kinds of conditions from sprains and strains and sports injuries, weekend injuries, uh, to work-related back injuries, neck injuries, car accidents, um, a variety of different conditions. We work hand-in-hand -hand with our primary care teammates. We work with the neurosurgery group, orthopedic group to take care of lots of patients from lots of different backgrounds. Bringing them back to function. I've heard that over and over again but about a physiatrist or, or a rehab doctor like you have. That's it, isn't it? The word function. I think it's the most important word and, and function can mean lots of different things. We get somebody back being the dad or the husband that they need to be. They can go on hikes, they can play catch with their kids in the yard, they right. can coach their kids' team. Um, we talk about getting back to work. You know, the employers and work comp and everybody, that's a huge thing, but it also matters to that individual and their family that they can go back and return back to their job or their ranch or their farm or whatever they need to do to earn a living. And you've come all the way from Rapid City today to to be on the show with us when we really do appreciate that huge gargantuan effort on your part. Craig, you're a, a, a family physician uh, from Sioux Falls. Right. Tell us a little bit about what, where you're from, what, what you're doing. Okay. I've been in Family Press for 25 years in Sioux Falls and with that I take care of babies that are newborn in the nursery all the way to patients that are 102, 103 years old, mm. some living at home and some in the nursing home. So are you involved with the education of family practice doctors, I mean, or are you um, separated somewhat from that? Uh, no, do I, I help in the education in the medical school, for example, and help in, uh, like a lot of my colleagues in South Dakota, we have medical students and residents that fo follow us, round with us, and work with us in the clinics. You know, as a med medical student, you, your training is really mentorship. You have a mentor, you follow them, and you watch how that person acts, and you try to yeah. learn from that. We're always working to improve the ways in which we communicate honest, science-based medicine to you, our audience. Vid visit us on your webs our website, oncalltv.org, on Facebook or Twitter to access previous episodes, extended interviews, and receive daily health tips. Today we are a recorded show. We cannot take your questions today, but we want to hear your feedback, so please go to our on-call site, oncalltv.org, and, uh, and give us your feedback. So really, one of the things that, the major thing that we're going to be talking about is treatment of pain and, the, and the, the medicines that we use and some of the trouble that we get by using those pain medicines. 
But let's talk about the difference. Now, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I don't think people realize how important this is, the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. Could you give us a little bit more about that, Chris? Sure, I think the, the easy description of acute and chronic pain is, is something that has just happened up to about six months we categorize as acute pain. And as you mentioned, that sprains and strains and fractures, uh, injuries that happen uh, that typically would take somebody to go see the doctor, go to the emergency room, um, you hurt your back shoveling snow and, and it doesn't get better over the course of the weekend and then you go in that week and see somebody to talk about it. Um, I, I think that's the acute category. We talk about chronic pain being pain that probably should have gone away or things that you would expect to get better with time but hasn't and it just persists and it continues and it continues and sometimes it gets worse and worse and, and it has building effects as that goes forward for you. I, and I have to say in the, new, or in the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine this month there's an article saying that 25% of the pain that is acute can go on and become chronic, which is treated entirely different. And many, many times, you're, there's no long-term danger except for it takes you out of function. Craig, you were gonna, you're, uh, you're gonna say. Well, uh, just a perfect example of acute pain going into chronic pain is the patient that has surgery. And I work in Sioux Falls, and I uh, would say there are probably 500 surgical cases in a day in Sioux Falls. If you take the oral surgeons for dental work, you take same day surgery, you take the hospitals. One out of 10 individuals is susceptible to having a problem with an opioid, meaning they might get hooked on an opioid where they take it for non-medical reasons. What's an opioid? Reason. An opioid would be a narcotic, it's a controlled substance, so hydrocodone, oxycodone, hydromorphine, you hear these. You're a Percocet, you hear of those different terms. Vicodin. Vicodin, you know, so those are the things you hear about. Um, one in ten. One in ten is susceptible. So if you have 500 surgeries in a day, just in Sioux Falls, that means 50 people are at risk to having trouble with their pain pills and maybe becoming dependent on that if they um, are not controlled and get that pain under control. So, patient comes in to see me in the office, and it's not uncommon for them to have acute pain. And we say, if you have acute pain and you just had surgery, take your pain pill. But I have patients that come into my office and they say, you know, I feel terrible. Uh, I had surgery 10 days ago and I just, I just don't feel well. I just feel nauseated. And I say, well, what are you doing? They say, well, I'm taking two pain pills every four hours. And I say, well, how much pain are you having? I'm not really having pain. <laughs> so I'll say, well, why don't you stop the pain pills? If you have the pain, take it. They call back two days later and say, I can't believe it. It was the pain pills that were making me feel sad. Feel so bad. Mm -hmm. But some of those pains will get worse. And what is the trick? What is the reason that those pains don't go away? I mean, the classic case I can think of is the guy who had a knee surgery. The knee surgery uh, hurt. After the uh, surgery, uh, the guy didn't want to move his knee because it hurt. And he wouldn't move his knee. And all the rehab effort we could try to get him to move his knee, he didn't want to move because it hurt. And that pain persisted, and he never got out of it. And it was non-functioning knee, and it persisted in pain. You've seen those stories. Sure. And it could be a, a bad surgical outcome. Uh, something didn't get positioned correctly, or it was the wrong sized piece or something that was used. Uh, it could be, like you said, that the patient didn't do the right kind of rehab. They didn't get their muscles strong, either before their surgery or after their surgery. They didn't get moving correctly. There can be complications like infections and blood clots and things that happen with surgery that can lead to painful conditions that then compound what's going on. So here I was trying to make the point that it's the patient's fault. They've got to get moving. They've got to get moving. You've got to not, you're at risk. You've got to get moving. It's your responsibility to get moving. And you came back with this beautiful, perfect, good doctor answer. And sometimes it isn't the patient's fault. Sometimes there's a clot. Sometimes there's an infection. Sometimes they didn't do things right. So we have to realize those things too. Well, that's what makes it so difficult. It's probably a combination of both. And both the physician that's treating the patient and the patient have a role in that matter. Yeah, that's a tough one.
Yeah. So in the patient, instead of getting another refill and another refill and another refill of the medicine, maybe you should get back into the doctor and be seen to see, is this pain different? Is it following what we normally would see? Yeah. After one refill, I would recommend the patient get in and see either the surgeon or their primary care doctor right. just to reevaluate it. Right, right. Managing a patient's chronic pain requires careful execution, balancing between the patient's need for relief and the fear of over-reliance on a drug. The best outcomes usually occur when the trinity of patients, physicians, pharmacists collaborate to track the treatment's progress and the recognition that pain medicines are not the only solution to this agonizing problem. Chronic pain is a problem we see a lot in the pharmacy. Uh, we see these patients come in and they're desperate for, for relief of their pain. And uh, just to be able to function, uh, they need some type of a relief. The common medications that we use for, for chronic pain are the opioid or the narcotic pain relievers, things like hydrocodone, oxycodone, methadone, and morphine. They are the most powerful pain relievers that we have, and they work very well for acute pain. They also have the tendency to cause some euphoria. So not only do we get pain relief, we get a euphoria and we feel good when we're using them. And that's maybe a little bit of a problem because these uh, narcotic opioid pain relievers have a tendency to cause uh, dependence, addiction, and tolerance. And tolerance is uh, when uh, the medication uh, kind of loses it, its effectiveness and you have to take more to get the same effect. There are other options for, for chronic pain besides the opioid analgesics, and hopefully some of these are tried before we start the opioid analgesics. Um, oftentimes we'll try to st try start out with a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain relievers like Motrin and ibuprofen. Unfortunately, the long-term use of those can cause kidney damage, so they have limited use. Other non-pharmacological therapies include uh, physical therapy, Physical therapy can be very helpful in relieving chronic pain. Um, stretching exercises, um, uh, exercise, uh, cardiovascular exercise, um, those type of things can help relieve chronic pain to some degree. We need to look at all options for chronic pain and not rely on the narcotic opioid analgesics. Uh, the CDC says opioid medication overdoses is at an epidemic level. So it's critical that we educate patients about misuse and abuse of these narcotic pain relievers. It's gonna take a whole team effort, physician, pharmacist, and patient as a team to work together to, to manage their chronic pain and avoid uh, misuse and abuse. That was just great. I appreciated so much that pharmacist jumping in and, f and filling the bill on that point. And uh, it, it really is true. I had a PharmD student monitor what the patient thought they were taking, what my records and my thought they were taking, and what the pharmacist thought they were taking. And there's like something like 50% of the time, there was no agreement. And uh, you know, it, 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 we've got to have that connection. That that trinity, as he as he pointed out, needs to be needs to be there. Um, so he 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 talked about different kinds of pain modalities. What was your take, Chris, on on what he said? Well, I, I think we all approach a patient with pain thinking, okay, we have a toolbox. We have all these things that we can use to try to treat or manage their pain, and it's almost like a little bit of a ladder within there of how do we treat this? You don't go to the big gun right away. Let's start with something simple. We start with ice, we start with heat. You know, ice packs and heat pads work really, really well to handle a lot of early types of pain or simple pains. Sometimes they can make other things work even better. Then we go to the over-the-counter type medications that he talked about, Tylenol, Advil, Ibuprofen. And then from there, if we still have troubles, then you kind of climb the ladder on the degree of uh, potency of the medications that we use, getting into some of the narcotics or... Uh, or anesthesia drugs. Uh, sure. Well for nerve... Mm -hmm. Right, and, and I think that's where you have all these tools that you try to utilize the least invasive, least complicated first, and then work your way up. 
But we're not using those those early things quite as much as we should be. Is, is one of the things that I, I think is happening. Certainly not. I think we see a lot of times people go to an emergency room or go to an urgent care and they get a narcotic right away and they haven't tried all the other tools that they could use first. They, they haven't utilized all those other things first. They may have saved themselves a trip to an emergency room or an ER by doing some of those things. Well, and utilizing the physiatrists and the rehab and the physical therapy people, that's something that people got to make sure that they're using. Uh, they've underutilized uh, those. You're not being uh, used as enough, Chris. Well, I think those modalities make a huge difference for a lot of conditions, and so the risks of doing those types of treatments are, are greatly outweighed by the risks of taking narcotics and opiates and all the risks that, you know, Dr. Uthi has mentioned and that, that we know exist. And so you kind of want to gradually step your way up yeah. as far as risk and complications go. Right. Correct. Well, there's something called hyperesthesia also. So if a patient takes a pain pill, if they take it for too long, then when they stop taking the pain pill, they actually, the pain they had before may be worse than the pain when it first started. Not everybody has that. There is some genetic predisposition on how patients are gonna to respond to pain pills. Some people take a pain pill and then it works. They take three, they've got a prescription with 25 pills in it, yeah. and they don't take the remaining because they don't need it. Yeah. And there are other that take the whole bottle and they don't get the pain relief and they want to get right. more. And when you stop it, they have a rebound. I mean, and Tylenol, I learned this with Carol Miles when she was on our headache show, mm -hmm. that a lot of people will have a rebound from the narcotics, rebound from the, the uh, Tylenol as well. Certainly the, the benzos, the, 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 the uh, anti-spasm meds can cause some rebound as well. Less with the neurologic mm -hmm. drugs such sure. as the gabapentin. Well, and people can have problems with the medications themselves. You get nausea, you get constipation, you get dizzy, you get lightheaded. Confusion. Right, and, and so all these side effects then, sometimes people take other medications to help with the side effects from the medications they were taking, and now we've got kind of all kinds of drug-drug interactions going on. And so there's problems, and it's a difficult uh, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. Mm -hmm. Everybody has pain at different times. And there's nothing wrong with taking a Tylenol, an ibuprofen. Ibuprofen would be like uh, Advil, Advil, Motrin, you know, those. Or Aleve, that's naproxen. Uh, in small amounts, infrequently, those medicines are fine. They can take pain away. But I would say if a pain lasts longer than maybe a week, uh, if they're taking a medication and they're taking four, six pills a day, they should get a hold of their primary care provider and, and get in and see them, right. see what's going on. Carol Miles said for headaches, you don't want to take Tylenol more than three times a week. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So uh, the other modalities that we have uh, really uh, are activity, I think. So let's just say that you're a person watching this show and you have a chronic uh, uh, pain and you're not going to the doctor, but you would like to have some general principles or suggestions or recommendations what to do to try to help alleviate their chronic pain, chronic back pain. Let's just take a chronic back pain. Sure. I think you have to move. And uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Engelbrecht in Rapid City, tells people it may seem like ridiculously little amounts, but you have to start walking. If that's two minutes is all you can do, if it's five minutes, if it's 10 minutes, that's what you do. Uh, most everybody has access to some place that they can walk. It's a little bit tougher in South Dakota in the winters because it's slippery and icy, but you know, you go to a community center, you go to a mall, you go to the school, and you walk around. Um, if you can't do very well with walking, sometimes we get in a pool and get people into water and get people moving in the water. Um, it takes a lot of stress off your back, a lot of weight and gravity. Um, you can move a lot better with those things eliminated. But it's really, at the end of the day, it's all about moving. Boy, I think that's a key, isn't it? If you can take home one message, it's all about moving. I think that's it. And if you sit there and you worry about it and you're sitting on your duff and you're thinking about your pain, it's only going to get worse and it's only going to continue forever and a day. You know, and we're learning. For the physician to say, you go do this and you'll be better, that doesn't always work. The best approach is to say, what are you willing to do? You're in pain, we want to get you better. What would work for you? You tell us. Now if I said, you should go swim every day um, and they have access to a pool, they may not like to get into water. 
But if they tell me, you know, um, I have a dog, I like to walk my dog, uh, well, tell me about that. Uh, what would work for you? And you try to get the movement through going through what we call the patient-centered medical home, where we have the patient tell us what they think might be helpful for them. I think that's really true, isn't it? Too many bossy doctors, the patients have <laughs> got to have the, the direction. I think that's it. Well, we want to fix patients, and the patients think that's going to work if we give them a pill. And it doesn't work, especially in chronic pain, because you don't necessarily fix chronic pain. Patients learn to live with it. Um, especially with the back injury. I think the word fix mm -hmm. is tossed around with spine surgeons in, in my practice a lot. And people think their back is like a pickup truck. I can go get a new part, get a surgery, and then I'm going to exit out six weeks later and everything's going to be good as new. And that's not the case. Even if you have an extensive spine surgery, you're still going to have other areas around that surgery that may hurt or may take more stress or pressure. And so we, we talk about the new normal and, and how you're going to have to learn to function with that and how you're going to have to get stronger around what you've injured and protect that area. And we talk about changing some of your activities, thinking about how you lift or how you do things differently than you did before. I had a case of uh, a woman, a lovely lady. I, I particularly loved her because she cared for her uncle. And I got to know her because when her old uncle, who is uh, he was an alcoholic. This was in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was had been rejected by everybody, never married, no kids, nobody to take care of him. She took care of him. You know, she had a number of kids in her family, in her, in her home, her children, and her husband, and she took her uncle in and uh, took care of him and into the clinic to see me as I was caring for her. Well, somewhere along the line, she was in a car accident. She was hit behind. There was a lawsuit involved. And the pain that she had, the whiplash or whatever it was, only got worse as the lawsuit progressed. It was as though she had to have the pain to justify the lawsuit. And when it was all said and done, the, the person they were suing really didn't have any money. The only person who ended up with any money was the lawyer. And the person, that patient, that lovely lady, was so disabled. She was in a wheelchair. And, uh, and uh, I said to her, you know, there, the, it isn't the drugs that's going to help you. you you've got to finish this lawsuit, get it done with. And she did. And then she had a long road, but she pulled back out of it with a long, you know, a long story. Mm -hmm. Once the lawsuit was done, and I, I've seen that. I've heard it mm -hmm. uh, written, lawsuit, viability, waiting on that lawsuit. And these lawsuits take two years, three years mm -hmm. sometimes. Well, and the other similar scenario is a work injury. Workers' compensation injury, if you have a patient who doesn't like their job, doesn't get along with their boss, their motivation to get well or to recover and get back to doing that is certainly different than our typical farmer or rancher who is running the family business. Yeah. And it's amazing what he can do and get back to, to to make his farm function and you know provide for his family. And he ends up with a lot less pain than that poor guy who, who whose pain is dependent, uh, his, his time off of work is dependent on his pain. Well, that pain is just getting worse and he's getting less and less able to function and he's caught in a deadly uh, uh, cycle of worsening. And so you're talking about motivations. I mean, there's underlying motivations, and, and I think Dr. Youthy talks about dual diagnoses, other things, not just the back injury, not just the knee injury. There's other things that are part of this equation for that patient. Like what? I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a patient, she's about 60 years old, and she had um, a minor surgery done and was put on hydrocodone. Five milligrams, she was taking it four times a day, a fairly low dosage. Right. Uh, came and saw me about two months after she did the surgery and said, I tried to come off my pills and I could not. Hmm. And she was feeling what we call withdrawal symptoms. She was feeling shaky. She was uh, sweating and she wanted some help. Well, we make a long story short, we found out her husband had died like six months earlier and she was no longer having the pain, but boy, did it make her sleep better at night. So her pain was gone but she was taking the pills. And I said, well, why are you taking the pills? You know, I just, I just felt so relaxed. It made me feel well. Well, we actually screened her, we treated her. We found she was suffering from depression. So here she had this minor surgical procedure for pain. The pain went away, but she found that her depression was treated by this pain pill. That's right. called visceral pain. Yeah. So she was hurting, but she wasn't in pain. 
you know, and how, the pain that helped. How many people are hurting? I mean, there's a lot of people who have psychological hurting. And then, of course, you get the pain of some injury, and that's perpetuated by the hurting, the, the psyche. It's not to say that uh, they don't hurt, but it's certainly worsened by the stresses of life, which many, many yeah. people are. And there's a stigma. Most people don't want to talk about right. psychological pain, right? Yeah. There's kind of a mm -hmm. societal stigma of don't admit that you're depressed or that you have these well, issues. Particularly if you're a guy from South Dakota, you would never be depressed. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You can be angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, my patient who had that, we were able to taper her off the medications over about a month. Add a SSRI. Add a, yep, yep. A, and, 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 I was, and, and we had an antidepressant. We got her some grief counseling, and she now is off those meds, is thankful for it, has some insight as to what was going on, and was very grateful, and, very, and, and she's doing very well now. Huh. Okay. And, and sometimes being depressed is a normal part of a chronic illness. If you've lost function, you've lost your job, you can't return back to your job. You and can't, you're hurting. Right, and you can't play sports or you can't do certain things with your kids or your family that you used to do. That can be a depressing event right. to somebody and that's a normal phenomenon. It's part of that adjustment to the loss of your function. Even in people who don't seem depressed and who in fact may not be by any clinical measure depressed, if they have chronic pain, I will use an antidepressant, and it is remarkable how much better they can get with one of those antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't have depress depression, maybe they do subclinical, or maybe they are denying it, and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, I think they're some of our most effective pain medicines. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, we, we talked a little bit about some of the central pathways and how these pain signals kind of get burned in. Certainly, at a pharmacologic level, the antidepressants do have benefit at some of the serotonin receptors, norepinephrine receceptors. Um, they're, they're pain medicines. It has an effect centrally on that, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. Cymbalta and mm -hmm. the effects are in particular, and there's a couple new ones that people are talking mm -hmm. about. Absolutely. So. And, and even if they're not completely successful all by themselves, they certainly are a great adjunct to some of the other pain pathways or routes that may decrease your need for opiates or decrease the dosing. and. Uh, they're good tools to work together right. with. And I can't say enough about gabapentin, which I oh. think is something underutilized and is very effective for pain. What were you going to mm -hmm. say? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, pain is very real. And when we have the narcotics, the hydrocodones, oxycodones to treat it, what a wonderful drug it is when used properly. So I don't want to underestimate the, the good the value use, of, use yes. of that. But we look at pain in the medical world in two ways, chronic pain. One is cancer pain, and there we call it chronic non-cancer pain. And when it comes so to can cancer pain and chronic yeah. non-cancer pain. Mm -hmm. And the problem with chronic non-cancer pain is if you just keep treating the pain, what happens is you develop two things. One is you develop a tolerance, meaning if you took 20 milligrams of hydrocodone in one day at one time, six months later you maybe need 80 milligrams of hydrocodone a day to take that same pain away. If a person took 80 milligrams of hydrocodone after having never taken it before, you would be dead. You'd be dead. <laughs> One of the side effects to overdose of opioids is it depresses your breathing. That's how people with an overdose of an opiate die. They just, their, their breathing that we breathe normally when we fall asleep, it stops that. That's how overdose and works. And people are dying. And people die. And there are a lot of people dying A lot right of people now. die. In fact, the, mm -hmm. the death rate for opioids right now is, mm -hmm. is climbing. And usually it's where there's a combination of medications used. Somebody adds a sleeping right. medication, somebody adds a, yeah. a different psychologic medication, they add a little alcohol to the mix or take some alcohol some sometime more than they normally would. And, and the narcotic. And the narcotic, or you forget, did I take my narcotic or not this evening? Okay, I better take another one. And now there's multiple things in the mix and people go to sleep and don't wake up. And that's why you'll see patients saying, well, why won't my doctor give me my pain pill prescription? Well, it's, it's not that we don't want them to have, not have pain, it's we don't want them to go down that road where they might have the adverse side effect, which right. can be fatal. Yep. After dealing with his own abuse problems, Mike Gilmartin turned his life around and now is the director of Teen Challenge of the Dakotas. His life experience gives him a unique insight into the problem of overcoming drug addiction. We see a lot, still a lot of guys that are hooked on meth. You know, meth is devastating, of course, and, and it drives men to do like really foolish things, to say the least. Um, uh, you know, it tears them apart physically and it really brings them down fast. 
but we're seeing a lot of heroin addiction, you know, um, an old an old drug that's kind of made a resurgence in, in, in the culture. Um, a lot of prescription drug addiction issues, a lot of uh, a lot of dysfunction and pain going on there. You know, it might stem from uh, an initial injury and then they, these guys get uh, hooked on these meds or it can just be that whole subculture that deals with prescription drugs. So I have to encourage people often to let go and let their loved one um, fall on his face. And it's a very scary prospect because these guys that are addicted, anything could go wrong. But it's not the parent's job. When the individual is of age and they rebel and they go against what they know deep down in their heart is right, then they have to deal with those consequences. So we have to tell families, back off. Let them fail. Don't help them by enabling them to stay stuck. And what we see are men coming into the program who are fearful, bitter, wounded, prideful, a lot of pride, you know, they may be messed up, but they still, they want to argue, they want to self-defend and self-protect. So we see them coming in with all these hang-ups and all this, you know, shame and guilt and pain, but they're masking it, of course, with, you know, bravado and false pride and all this sort of thing. But uh, when guys begin to humble themselves and begin to uh, identify uh, hope and they begin to sense that you know God loves them uh, they begin to realize that they can be forgiven for their past sins and their mistakes and their failures and when they know that you love them then they change Wasn't that, I mean, you know, and when they know they're loved, they can change. I thought that was whew, uh, really powerful. But we're talking about addiction, and that's it happened uh, to these people. Now, you should meet some of these Teen Challenge um, graduates. I mean, they're, uh, you know, you, you see some of the greatest people uh, and uh, dear, dear friends of mine, and uh, uh, they've, they were in the gutter before. It's amazing what that can, what help uh, they can have, but <clears throat> there are people out there that are uh, habituated. They're caught in it. Uh, they're dependent. Uh, they are very addicted uh, people with not only heroin and meth, but uh, prescription drugs and other medications. There is abuse. There are people who are diverting. I mean, they go in, they ask for pain medicines, they use, take it, and then they go out and sell it. Uh, all of this is happening. What, what can we do to stop that? Well, one of the tools that we use is something called the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or the South Dakota PDMP. And this is a tool that the pharmacist, the physician, uh, and the State Board of Pharmacy manage, uh, where we can look at a database, and you can look at a patient's prescription history and see for controlled substances have they been getting medications at multiple other stops and other ERs or other urgent cares and I think it's important that you identify is this a legitimate pain patient or is this one of these scenarios where somebody is drug seeking or somebody is diverting or trying to just stockpile and get as much medication as they can. It doesn't mean that you don't help that person it just means that you have a better understanding of where they're coming from and what's going on. Right. Well, it's an illness. You know, people that are diverting drugs or people that are um, addicted and they're doctor shopping and they're going to different pharmacies, stealing meds out of uh, family members' cabinets. If you ask them, they're, they're not saying, oh, I love doing this. I love going around <laughs> and trying to get this. Uh, they have an illness and they're trying to be normal and they just don't know how to do it. They need help. They, they can be under the grips of, of an addiction that That's is a, a great terrible, terrible they are They are being just gripped by the disease and overwhelmed. And a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, and they don't want to come in and, yeah. and admit it. Uh, once they can do that, that's a, a big step in the... I think there's fear of criminal stigma in coming to admit, I have a problem with this or I've been doing this. And so people shy away from seeking out help in those situations. Well, I mean, it's the same picture as alcohol. I mean, I, I think they, they are 
uh, brothers of illness. And uh, I mean, I've, I've lost a dear friend, great guy, wonderful personality, very, very smart, you know? And it pulled him down and killed him, and in short order. Now, how addiction works is there are a lot of substances that are addicting. The one that we haven't talked about yet tonight is uh, alcohol. Now, alcohol itself, most people can take one drink and not be hooked on it at that moment. But over a period of time, if they use it chronically and in different uh, levels of consumption, they become dependent on it. You take heroin, IV, you take crystal meth, you take some of those drugs. They, I've had patients tell me, I did it once and I knew I was hooked on it. Highly addicting drugs. And those are very, very difficult to overcome. Those are the ones we think about. They go through treatment centers, they come out. Uh, when they get through recovery, it's, a, it's just wonderful to see them uh, come through recovery. So there's different kinds of addiction. One's a more of a slow onset, and the other ones are more addicting rapidly. Uh, you know, the <clears throat> there are, I, I think the methamphetamine is the most difficult because it is destructive of the individual. And, and probably the narcotics are not as destructive uh, but and this, but almost as more destructive than the narcotics are the sleepers. I've heard the the sleepers and the benzos. People get dependent on those, and then they they get depressed and they get more depressed, and then they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all of these can be equally destructive. If you ruin someone's life, if you wreck their family scenario, if you interfere with their ability to work, you've created a significant damage in that in that situation. It just depends on how quickly it happens and how that evolves. I think the methamphetamine folks one or two times of using the medication and they're addicted and some people say the first time, the first time you do it uh, and you're done right. versus an opiate it may take mm -hmm. several time. months or several mm -hmm. years before you have those same problems. Right. But there's hope So where for is these hope? individuals. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. Again, it is a disease, and it takes medical professionals to get help for something like this. Rarely, when I say rarely, it's less than 0.1% is a person able to stop on their own by themselves without professional help. It may mean something called an intensive outpatient program where a person can keep working and have daily assistance. Sometimes it requires an inpatient treatment program like we call it Betty Ford. We talk about Hazleton. Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge, all our local places. Um, so again, there are multiple options that are available for patients, but they need to seek help. That is the biggest step to take is to say, you know what, I can't do this. I'm powerless to myself and I need some help. So, uh, or we'll find out. To, to, to explain the, the again, you, you brought it up, the, the uh, PDMP. PDMP. Explain that a little bit more, Chris. It's a database of, it's a registry of prescriptions of controlled substances that have been filled. So if you go to a pharmacy and, and you get some hydrocodone after your surgery, you fill it, the pharmacist enters it into the database and you know, you come see me two months later or two and weeks you, later. And you go on your computer? I can access the database, I can find out. Physician Drug Monitoring Program, PDMP, it's there. We watch that, we can see yeah. if, how and, many and doctors. You, and you say, I had my surgery, I'm still not doing well, I have all kinds of pain and problems. Um, I only had 30 pills after my surgery, I ran out, I need somebody to help me with my pain. And I can log into the database and say, well, you actually been to two ERs and three urgent cares uh, in the last two weeks, and you've gotten all these number of pills from all these different providers. Right, and the answer is no, no more from me. What do you do with a person who says, I'm desperate, I, I, okay, I'm, I'm hooked, I need uh, some help, I'd like to have some tapering, but I've got to have some more medicines, and I've got to have some help with this chronic pain, and narcotics is the one thing that helps. What do you do with that guy? You need a plan of action. And so it's kind of like if I have a patient that was jumped out in the ocean and didn't, I would throw them a life preserver. And that's kind of the way it is for a person that has an addiction and they want to get help. It's fear. You know? Because what happens is, what an addict tells me is, I just want to feel normal. And if I take my medicine, I feel normal. And if I don't take it, I feel terrible. Uh, if there's pain involved, if I take it, I don't have pain. If I do take the medicine, I, have, I don't have the pain. Uh, once you get a person through who has chronic pain through a treatment facility, a treatment center, their pain is always less, 
even though they aren't taking the pain pills anymore. Interesting. So the nice. pain is partly involved in their opiate dependence. Well, it's not a light switch. Pain is not either it's on or it's off. Mm -hmm. And I think people get into the habit of chasing a zero. I don't want, I don't want to feel any pain at all, nothing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is we want to minimize that and manage that and make things less of a focus or less intense. But there may be a point in time after certain surgeries or after trauma or a motor vehicle collision with a severe whiplash injury that things may never exactly be perfectly normal again, but can you learn to manage and deal with what your new normal is yeah. and, and how do you function with that? That's huge, I think. It's, it's like, okay, so we're not gonna be zero. You're gonna, ha but to live with it, you gotta get moving. Right, and how do you manage that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's with the activity like we talked about. It's appropriate use of modalities like heat or ice or over-the-counter medications, maybe some prescription medications in controlled settings and in controlled dosages, as long as they're not creating more problems. And making a contract is what you're saying. Yeah. Sometimes you make a contract with a patient and say, okay, I'm the only doctor you're going to see. That's the only pharmacy you're going to go to. Break the rule, we're done. I think you have to set some rules or boundaries or parameters and the patient has to be a participant in that. Um, given the stakes, the stakes are high. There's a risk of abuse, there's a risk of tolerance or dependence on these medications. These aren't benign medications that you're agreeing to treat with um, and so you have to regulate that and manage that. They, th they talk about doing urine tests to see if uh, 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 levels of, of that particular drug is in, on board. What, how would you use that, Craig? Okay. If I have patients that come into my office that have chronic pain and they're on an opiate four times a day, okay, I have patients that do that. They're not drug seeking. They develop a tolerance level to a certain amount, but they're living with their pain and they're taking three hydrocodones a day. Right. Okay. I have. I have. Uh, a and they can do it for lady who has that same thing. Mm -hmm. And she's, but again, we want to monitor that. It's a controlled substance, meaning it's got high addictive properties to it. Anytime I use a drug that's got dangers to it, I want to keep control over that, make sure the patient's using it properly. Um, we do use a urine drug screen at our discretion to check for drugs. And if we do that and we see methamphetamine or we see marijuana or we see um, other controlled substances in that and they're not being open to us telling us why that is, the combination of those medications can be deadly for one thing. And the second thing is, is they are now showing addictive behavior. That's different than having a chronic dependency and not drug seeking or not being dependent. So and, the and urine drug the screen other... shows risk. And then we want to step back and say, okay, let's look at this again. There's more going on here than just your chronic dependence. And you establish that rapport right away with the patient. If you come see me on the first visit and you say, I moved here from Arizona or California, I had a couple of car accidents, I have chronic pain, I'm taking these medications, and, and you disclose on your history form and in our patient interaction that this is what you're taking and then we do a drug screen at an initial visit and none of the things you're telling me add up in the drug screen and there's all kinds of other medications and different things that relationship is already tarnished a bit right, right? the yeah. trust that needs to be there in this agreement in this relationship doesn't mean that we're not going to try to help you but it certainly in, impedes that that relationship between the physician and the patient and that level of trust that really is necessary to treat with these dangerous medications. Right, so one patient of mine, quickly now, we're almost at the end, uh, ha uses marijuana for pain relief. He finds it works, nothing else has worked. It helps him with his severe arthritis, and he's got it, I mean, he, there's, and uh, of course it's not legal here, but it's legal elsewhere. What's your take on the marijuana thing? Uh, it's a double-edged sword. Okay, again, people are susceptible and vulnerable to having a problem. It's kind of the patient tells me, you know, I just have two glasses of wine every night because it helps my heart. A double-edged sword. Um, it may not be harmful for some people, it may be harmful for others. So um, the answer to that question is every patient's a little bit different. And if we can give them help with something that's not a mood-altering substance, we would always, always prefer that. Yeah. And yeah. marijuana is a mood-altering substance. Yeah, sure. And it's not regulated. Every single dose of marijuana is different from the one before that. 
I mean, we just don't know the potency. We don't know the mm -hmm. amount of cannabinoid property. You don't know the amount of THC it's sort of in like each all dose. Supplements, isn't it? Right. I mean, you know. So let's. We've got thirty second take home, Craig. Uh, chronic pain is real. We want to take. We want to treat it uh, respectfully. We build trust up with our patients with that. You have to understand it's a two. Uh, it's a two uh, sided coin. We treat pain. We treat that, but there's also the side effect of the dependence that can happen. So when a physician questions a patient about an opiate, it's not because we don't trust the patient, it's because there might be risk with it. Right. 30 seconds. I think we said on this before, but I think you have to move. It's all about activity and getting back to function. Whatever you can do, however you can do that, you have to get back in some capacity to, to movement and activity and, and what you're doing. That's great. Thanks so much. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Denise Siren, and this is Marketplace Matters. Now that you're enrolled in a Marketplace Health Plan, you might think your work is done, but it's not. Every fall, your insurance company sends out a letter notifying you of any changes in your policy. It's important to review that letter because if you're no longer happy with your plan, you'll have a chance to change it during the open enrollment period. Here are some things to look for. Is your provider still in your plan's network? Are your prescriptions still covered? Have your cost or services changed? Is your personal information correct, such as your income and household size? If you're happy with your plan, it's still offered next year, and you don't have any life changes to report, then do nothing and in most cases you'll automatically be re-enrolled. If you're not sure whether your current plan is still your best option, you can log on to healthcare.gov and view the plans available to you. If you have life changes, report those changes to the marketplace to make sure you're getting the right amount of tax credit and other cost savings you may be eligible for. This is true if you want to stay in the same plan or pick a new one. Your insurance company might decide not to offer your current plan next year. If that's the case, they might suggest another plan that's similar. Remember, you always have the option to look at other plans, even those offered outside the marketplace. But be aware that only marketplace plans offer tax credits that can lower your costs. To see your health coverage options, log on to healthcare.gov. To make changes in your policy, remember these dates. Open enrollment starts November 15th and runs through February 15th. Mark your calendar. That is your window to act. And don't forget, when the marketplace or your insurance company sends you information, read it carefully and make note of important deadlines. For more information about staying enrolled through the marketplace, visit healthcare.gov or contact your insurance company. And remember those dates. Don't miss out on the latest news and updates from the marketplace. Here's how to stay connected. Partners presents Home Flu Remedies. History suggests there are several methodologies to beat the flu bug. There's sweat therapy, leech therapy, snake therapy, and of course the ever popular shock therapy. Want to know the best way to beat the flu bug? Get vaccinated. With the flu bug still hanging around, it's not too late. There's probably no more daunting condition than chronic pain. Experts agree that any pain lasting longer than six months will no longer respond to the regular treatment for acute or new pain, but requires a totally different approach. Mr. AB has had low back pain for at least 25 years, and with two failed back surgeries, he hasn't been able to work for about 10 years. He takes regular and high doses of hydrocodone, the most commonly prescribed narcotic, along with other pain, muscle spasm, and sleeping medications without relief. He's overweight, sleeps poorly, is divorced, and says this is someone else's fault. Other people with chronic pain syndrome can have diabetic neuropathy, severe arthritis, post-shingles nerve pain, chronic pelvic pain, bladder irritability, fibromyalgia, and migraine headaches, and more. Many of these people are completely disabled. A recent study reported about one out of three Americans suffer from some kind of chronic pain, which is greater than that of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. And estimates 
have it costing the U.S. more than $600 billion a year in treatment and lost productivity. Chronic pain often starts with nerve irritation from trauma, infection, pressure, or inflammation. One theory is that it lasts long, if it lasts long enough, like an itch, the human brain becomes obsessed. And after a while, because of attention to the irritation, escape from suffering grows increasingly more difficult. Such discomfort is also made worse by reduced activity, fatigue, sleeplessness, anxiety, depression, irritability, and isolation, all increasing the risk for suicide. Such sad feelings are an understandable consequence of pain. Unfortunately, narcotics, also called opioid pain medicines, are not that helpful for treating chronic pain. They're rife with side effects, require ever-increasing doses for effectiveness, can cause rebound or worsening pain, and are highly addictive to boot. The good news is that many other therapeutics, such as nerve active or vasoactive or psychoactive medicines, work much better for chronic pain than opioids. Perhaps the most effective way to help <clears throat> is a daily exercise or activity program tailored to the ability of the individual. But those suffering with this should realize that despite all modern medical advancements, complete relief from chronic pain is too often not achievable. So people with chronic pain and doctors treating them should set realistic objectives. Three such goals include avoiding excessive use of opioids, redirecting attention to something else besides their pain, all while doing whatever possible to get back to function. Well, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our fantastic guests tonight, Chris Diedrich and Craig Uthie. One of the perks of being broadcast on South Dakota Public Television is that we also reach viewers from surrounding states who live along the borders. We would love to make our program available to the public broadcasting stations in your state too. On Call with a Prairie Doc would be given to them free of charge to broadcast to their viewers delivering our message of honest, science-based health information to the rest of your state. To that end, we'd ask you to contra contact your local public broadcasters, ask them to carry our program. One call from you could make an important difference to many people. If you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, please do so. It's not too late. According to the Centers of Disease Control, February is often the biggest month for the flu. In other words, whether you have had the flu already or not, you can prevent illness by getting a flu shot now. Radio host Garrison Keeler provided this prayer for dealing with life. Thank you, God, for this good life and forgive, forgive us if we do not love it enough. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, 
the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.